Life, was, life in the home wasn't very successful. School wasn't much better. I left school with nine no levels. <laughs> the only time I got a glow report is when I burnt it on the way home. My sports teacher, truth, actually wrote, Akabusi has no sporting ability. Oh. <laughs> so many teachers in the house, sorry. But you know, things were to change when I left school and I left the home to join the army. I joined the army and the very first day I lined up on the parade square with 800 other young men and they wheeled out this machine, it's called a sergeant major. <laughs> tick tock, tick tock, BAM! Regiment, regiment, Shanna! 800 men on parade! By the end of the 28 weeks, some will be sick, some will be lame, and some will go home to mama! I knew you didn't mean me because I didn't have one. <laughs> Each and every day, my friends, this guy came out and read the toll of the sick, lame, lazy, and those who'd gone home to mum. 28 weeks later, tick tock, tick tock, bam! Regiment! Regiment! Shanna! 400 men on parade! 200 went sick! 200 are lame! So I can't do my maths. 100 are lame! <laughs> <laughs> and 100 went home to Mama! My friends, I heard those words. Yeah! I heard those words, my friends! For the first time in my life, I've become a success of something. For the first time in my life, I'd achieved something. For the first time in my life, I had an idea of what it was I wanted to become, and I went and I pursued it, and I became something. There is a saying that I've gleaned from the Bible that says, a people with no vision perish. People with no vision perish. For the first time in my life, I had an idea, I had a vision of what it was I wanted to accomplish with my life. You know, my friends, if you shoot through the stars, you may hit the sky. But if you aim nowhere, you won't miss your target. We require dreams. We require visions. We need to know what it is we want to acquire for our life. My friends, have you a dream? Have you a vision? Do you know what it is you want to accomplish with your life? You need to live your dream. You need to get your destiny. My friends, you know, we have dreams. We go hard, we work hard for them, but things don't always go out the way we mean them to, do they? I had a dream in athletics. I wanted to be the best. And I was the best in the 400 meters in this country. In 1984, I went to the Olympic Games, I came away with a silver medal, all right, all right. But all of a sudden, from being the best 400 meter runner in this country in 84, I found myself going to the European Championships 1986 as what we call the baggage man. All of a sudden, I found myself going to the European Championships carrying the bags. For you see, on the scene, there came some new kids on the block. One of them, Mr. Roger, pretty boy black. <laughs> all right, all the ladies in the house go, yo! All right! Dave Redmond, a wee guy called Todd Bennett. Five foot six, small man, big heart. Became the world champion, the world record holder indoors. All of a sudden, I went to the European Championship being a baggage man. You know, my friends, we live in a world of flux, a world of change. And if we cannot adapt in this world, we have to die. I wanted to continue with my chosen sport. So I went to the European Championships, my friend, and I decided I would not die, I would adapt. I looked at the various events going past, and I saw Roger Pretty Boy Black come out there, 19, I'd been training, uh, running for two years, European champion, 19 years of age. Derek Redmond, who'd been injured all season, for three weeks training, three weeks training, goes out there and goes under 45 seconds. Todd Bent, I've already mentioned. No chance in the 400 anymore. I watched 800 metres go by, my friends. Tom McKean, first. Cram, second. Uh, um, Co, third. One, two, three, the best in Britain, the best in Europe, the best in the world. No chance in the 800, my friends. 
I then saw the 400 meter hurdles go by and not one British athlete got past the first round. All right, I can do that. <laughs> yeah, I found my niche in the market. All of a sudden, my friends, I started saying to people, I know I'm now going to be a 400 meter hurdler. They said to me, Akabusa, you're mad because old dogs don't learn new tricks. I'm going to be a 400 meter hurdler. Akabusa, you're mad. Old dogs don't learn. New tricks. I came back from Stuttgart, Germany, came to the United Kingdom. I live in Southampton. Twice a week, I went from Southampton to Manchester doing a 500 mile round trip to train with Pete Warden, the national 400 meter hurdles coach. Three months later, when I thought I got enough knowledge, I went from him to the United States of America and trained with the best exponent this world has ever seen over the 400 meter hurdles, one Mr. Edwin Moses. Oh, hi. All of a sudden, my friends, I was fired. I was ready my very first race in California. You're supposed to go, woo, because you think I'm well travelled now. <laughs> in Kofu, my very first race, I get down there, represent my country, flying out the blocks, flying down the back straight, cool as a mountain stream. All right. Into that second break, second bend, I'm still leading. Into that final straight, all of a sudden, heard the late, grows, tackles me, bam! I see my legs up in the air like this. All I can see is people going past me, and I hear those words, Akabusi, old dogs, don't learn new tricks. But I get up, continue finish. At the end of that year, my friends, I went to the World Championships. I came seventh. Number one in this country. I remained number one in this country for seven consecutive years. I went on to be number one in Europe for five consecutive years. I went on to be number three in the world for three consecutive years. Not because I listened to all those naysayers who said, old oh, dog don't learn any tricks. Because I had a new vision, a new dream, and I was going to do the, be the very best that I can be. My friends. Thank you. My friends, flux, change is a part of life that's going to happen to all of us. It's what you ascribe, what meaning you put onto it that makes, defines what happens from then on. You know recently many people have been uh, um, un unemployed and up in the North East. For some of those people it means a slippery slope that nowhere. But for the others it means an opportunity, a chance, a challenge to do something new. You have that challenge here. You have the opportunity. I know that there are some people here in the audience today that have come with their sponsors and have this opportunity to get into the business. And my friends, you may think, if Akabuzi thinks it's like so good, why isn't he doing it himself? I had the opportunity in 1986. Someone came to me to show me the business. I looked at it, they came back, I said, guys, I'm into my trucking field, maybe some other time. 12 years later, I haven't gone into the business and right now I find myself wanting to be the fun-loving, entertaining television and, and, and pantomime celebrity. I want to be a, a fun-loving, awe-inspiring, peak performance, communicator. I want to be a fun-loving catalyst for change in Nigeria. I've got all these hats and all these things I want to do. Why do I tell you that story, my friends? Because there are moments in life when you have a small window for change, a small window of opportunity. You need to take that choice. For some people in this room, the choice is today, the choice is now. My friends, I've learned much in my life. I've learned about going out there and doing the very, very best I can do. I've learned about going out there and having that vision and that goal. I've learned that in life, we live in environments that adapt a flux and we need to change or we die. But there's something else I've learned, my friends, that ties all those things together, that ties you and me together. And that is we need to cooperate one with another in teams. I've been very fortunate in my life to be part and parcel of a great British relay team, a 4 by 4 team. I've been really privileged to be part and parcel of the team and to learn about those sort of dynamics. My friends, let me tell you a story about us going to Tokyo in 1991 because we had a huge dream. We had a huge vision in our, in our minds. We wanted to be the best team in the world. What you need to understand is that the best team in this world for over 50 years had been the United States of America. And at this juncture, I need to apologise to anybody of American distraction. I mean extraction. <laughs> but I'll tell the story nonetheless. 
We wanted to be the best team in the world, but the Americans were the best. And when they heard that we wanted to take them on, they said, no way, man. <laughs> they said, we're going to whoop your whoop, but ooh. With the guys, you can't say that, it's disrespectful. 